David Writing Wrongs. In our last story, we saw the end of Sheba's rebellion. Sheba had spread lies all throughout Israel about David's character. Eventually, the people began to see his evil for what it was and helped Joab take off his head. In this story, we learn about David's leadership through a time of hardship and continued struggle with other nations. David, even as he advances in years, perseveres through the chaos of kingship, inspired by 2 Samuel. Hello, this is Pastor Jack Graham with today's episode of The Bible in a Year. In yesterday's passage, we learned how Sheba's insurrection was quickly snuffed out when the people saw through his lies and killed him, preventing a bloody battle with David's army. Today, we'll turn our attention back to Jerusalem, where King David, now advancing in years, continues to rule through hard times, both internally and in conflict with neighboring nations. We'll see the perseverance of a king who continually seeks God's will and the best for his people. Let's listen now to today's scripture. David walked the city streets with his head held low. He felt his heart sinking deeper and deeper into his chest. He could hardly watch his people hungry. He felt helpless. As with many countries, Israel had experienced a famine in the land for over three years. Their reserves had run dry sooner than anticipated, and now many children were forced to beg on the streets. David did all he could to help but there was still scarcity. He fell before the Lord and listened. He wanted anything to help. Instead of a plan to restore the reserves of Israel or change the irrigation for farming, God gave David a different command. Go and care for the Gibeonites. Saul and his family were guilty of murdering their families without cause. David was confused at the Lord's request. How could he show generosity to a people group when his people were in so much need? Nevertheless, he summoned the leaders of the Gibeonites. The Gibeonites were not a part of Israel. However, Joshua had made a covenant with them to protect and care for them. This promise was broken by Saul, and he treated them like animals. David brought the Gibeonites into his home and had them sit. He offered them what little food he had, since times were hard and food was scarce even for the king. David sat down and looked at them compassionately. How can I make amends for what Saul did to your people years ago? The question surprised the Gibeonites. They had lived as victims of Israel for so many years that David's generosity seemed out of place. Still angry, yet pleased with David's heart, they said, No amount of money or resources could repair our broken people. We are down to a few families with almost no hope of restoration. His words hurt David's heart. He clenched his fist, angry at Saul's past cruelty. What can I do then? David asked with his hands open. Just tell me what would ease your hearts and I will do it. The men paused for a moment and whispered amongst themselves. They looked at David and said, Saul was the one who tried to destroy us. He took away our territory in Israel, killed our family, and sent us into hiding. Give us his remaining sons, so that we may execute them for their father's crimes. As harsh as this deal might have seemed, it was customary and reasonable in the land. David agreed, but did not allow them to have Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth. Jonathan was his dear friend and like a brother. He would not allow his only son to be harmed. With a heavy heart, David gave the rest of Saul's sons and grandchildren up to the Gibeonites. On a mountain overlooking the desolate land where the Gibeonites once lived, they slew the brothers. Shortly after, the famine in the land subsided. The ground became fertile once again as the rains came rushing in through the west. Barley and wheat began to sprout and the fish returned to the shores of Jordan. David wondered about the Gibeonites, how reconciling a past evil would bring prosperity back to Israel he did not know. He held these things in his heart and trusted God and his goodness. The entire land surrounding Israel was blighted and hardened from years of famine. Other nations watched as Israel began to recover quicker than the others. The prosperity of Israel drew the Philistines in like moths to a flame. They wanted their food, resources, and land. A hungry horde of Philistines arose from the east, and soon David was faced with yet another war. He assembled his mighty men, now grizzled veterans of battle. 
His mighty men had sons now able to fight, and the armies of Israel were stronger, younger, and more agile than ever. However David was growing old, his stamina was not what it once was, yet this did not deter him from putting on his armor and sharpening his sword. With his head held high, he led his men into the valley between Israel and the Philistines. With his sword held high, David ran into battle in front of his men. Although this time his men passed him, leaping into battle before him, David still fought with passion, skill, and speed. He delivered blows to every Philistine in his wake. However, with each kill he lost more and more of his energy. Slowly David's strength began to wane, and his lungs began to heave for air. In the distance, David could see a giant man hurling Israelite soldiers into the air. It was Ishbai Ibinob, the Philistine giant. His spear weighed over seven pounds, but he wielded it like a small blade. His sword was new, sharpened and sliced through his men as if they were warm butter. David began to have flashbacks of Goliath. He remembered his strong legs and hulking frame. Ishbai Ibinob would feel the same wrath. David began to run towards him. His legs were heavy and his arms were growing numb, but he had to protect his men. David rose his sword in the air to strike Ishbai, but was swatted away like a bug. David flew through the air and landed on his back. The air left his lungs and the sides of his vision grew dark. David looked up to find his sword, but only saw Ishbai looming over him. He cast a large shadow over David as he rose his spear in the air to strike him down. David looked up, knowing he could do nothing to save himself. This is where I die, David thought. As Ishbai's spear began its descent, a sword burst through the front of his chest. Ishbai's blood sprayed across David's face. Ishbai cried out and fell towards David. David rolled to his side, just dodging the Philistine's massive body crashing to the floor. The earth shook. Standing over David and Ishbai stood Abishai. He grabbed the hilt of his sword and pulled it out of the giant's corpse. Abishai grabbed David and helped him to his feet. You are no longer coming out to battle with us, Abishai said. We cannot risk the light of Israel being snuffed out. A few days of battle had passed, and more giants had risen from Gath. David's men were fighting in the Valley of Job, and a giant named Saph arose. His biceps were as strong as iron, and his hands could wrap around a man's head. He was slain in a fiery duel by Sibekai. Soon the brother of Goliath rose into battle, demolishing several men in his sight. His spear pierced through several men at once, and many men trembled at the sight of him. A brave young man from Bethlehem, by the name of Elhanan, ran into battle against him. He killed him with his spear. Another great Philistine with six fingers and toes on each limb was also fighting, but was killed in battle by David's nephew, Jonathan. David watched, amazed, as these brave young men of Israel rose up to slay giants. At one point in time, he was the only young man brave enough to face a giant. Now there were hundreds of men willing to lay down their lives for the sake of God's flock. God had raised up a whole nation of young warriors through the leadership of David. His loving and courageous guidance inspired an entire generation of people willing to slay giants for the protection of their families. This is what God did with David's slings and stones. He restored a cowardly generation of past slaves into a nation of brave and noble shepherds. We begin today's passage with a famine that is plaguing the land of Israel. Not only in Israel, but all the nations around. David's heart is grieving. It is heavy. He is hurting for his people who are suffering under the weight of such scarcity. And like he's done so many times in the past, David seeks God and seeks God's counsel. He is wanting to hear guidance on how to serve and save his people. What he gets is something else entirely. We find the answer in 2 Samuel 21 and verse 1. And the Lord said, There is blood guilt on Saul and on his house because he put the Gibeonites to death. Saul had broken a centuries-old vow made to Joshua to protect the Gibeonites. He had attempted to wipe them out, and for his betrayal, there had to be a consequence. 
So when David asked God how to deal with the famine and the answer was a charge of blood guilt, David knew that as king of Israel, he must make restitution to the Gibeonites. Interesting, isn't it? We sometimes deal with the consequences of the sins of others. There may even be sins of our fathers and mothers that affect us generations later, and God may call on us as the agent of reconciliation who, like David, are charged with righting a wrong we had no part in. So David calls the Gibeonites to him and asks how he can make it right. The Gibeonite elders tell him there is no monetary payment that can make it right, but neither do they seek revenge on Israel. Instead, they ask David to hand over Saul's sons so they may avenge the wrong done by his family by killing his sons. Harsh as this might sound, and it is harsh, it was a much less bloody option than the feuding and fighting that often went on these days as a result of grudges and conflicts between nations and families. So David agreed, but he spared Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth, keeping the promise to his dear friend, Jonathan, to protect his family. With the sin of Saul properly punished, the famine began to fade, and Israel recovered more quickly than other nations. God prospered his own people because of David's faithfulness. Their prosperity could not go unnoticed, and soon other nations, especially the Philistines, began to want what Israel had. And so, once again, it was time for war. Israel's army was very strong, however, and prepared to defend themselves. King David, now old, prepared to join them in the battle. Surely he remembered the sorrow he had brought upon himself and the nation the last time he set out a fight and sinned with Bathsheba. But although he was still a strong man, it soon became clear that he did not need to join the fight. It would be a foolish act to expose the king to death when so many able soldiers stood ready to defend God's nation. David's legacy of courage and strength lived on in the generations that were coming. The king who continually sought God's favor and experienced God's face and faithfulness in his life had built a nation that would show God's glory to the world. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the example of David, the man you described as after your heart, the one who always sought you for strength and courage and instructions and guidance in life. Let us be like David, men and women who seek you, who know you, and then who are courageous and committed in all that you desire for us to do, that we serve you, that we fight the good fight of faith, eager to make your name known in all the earth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you so very much for listening to today's Bible in a Year podcast. We are so very grateful for the millions of people who have downloaded this podcast. I'm Pastor Jack Graham, and when you download the Pray.com app and make it a priority in your life to listen to God's Word, your life truly will be changed. We are hearing reports from so many of the power of God's Word in their lives. So let me encourage you to pass this podcast on to others, to share it with someone you know, someone you care about, because the Word of God truly will change lives. And if you want more resources on how to experience God's power in your life, be sure to visit jackgraham.org. We would love to connect with you and for you to connect with us. Again, that's jackgraham.org. God bless you.